And I wanted to welcome you to the Healthy Communities Initiative webinar for this month, Information for Action, Using Local Data to Make the Case. Then Jeff Rowett and Blythe Thomas with Kansas Health Foundation will discuss how local data regarding healthy eating, physical activity, and chronic disease can help make the case for policy priority. They will provide an overview of available data, including orientations to report briefs sent out early this week that were developed for Healthy Communities Initiative. <laughs> and discuss how data can help you mobilize, engage, and persuade local stakeholders. On the line today, we have Sean Brown, Jeff Asher, Jeff Willett, and Blythe Thomas with Kansas Health Foundation. We also have Vicki James with Big Challenge, who will make a few announcements during the call today. Uh, Blythe and Jeff will begin with a slide presentation and will allow time for questions. And during the last 30 minutes of the webinar, from about 1 to 1.30, Jeff Chair will talk about grant status reports and other information about the Healthy Communities Initiative that many of you have been asking questions about. Um, a few housekeeping items before we begin. As with previous webinars, even though we have a new system that we're using this month, all of your lines are muted uh, to help reduce background noise. If you have a question, Please type it into the chat box on the bottom right side of your screen. And Sean will keep track of questions and will read them at the end of the presentation. If you would like to clarify a question that's already been raised in the chat box, um, please feel free to raise your hand using the button above the chat box. And Sean will see that your hand is raised and will include your line as soon as you can. Finally, we are recording the webinar and hope to archive this on SharePoint within a few days. With that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Jeff Usher. Hello, folks. Uh, uh, welcome to uh, this uh, first webinar of 2014. Um, uh, this, this is going to be the first, I think, um, webinar in which we can kind of showcase some of the assistance that foundations can provide to uh, our, our uh, community, public community, specifically around data and communication. Um, so we're going to have Jeff Willis, the Vice President of the Program, um, and Mike Thomas, the Vice President of the Community Communication, uh, uh, provide you uh, with this, this slide show. Uh, Jeff uh, has been with the foundation for uh, just about two years. Uh, he came from uh, New York. He was the director of uh, traffic control there at New York. He has a, a bachelor's degree from uh, Nebraska and a doctorate from Nebraska in sociology, a bachelor's in sociology. Uh, so he has experience in evaluating research, research specific communications and policy development. Um, and, and, I, and, and I think even though he was from, uh, or came from New York, uh, to the foundation is from the Midwest. I say he's one of us. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Blythe Thomas is uh, our, our new uh, uh, vice president here at the foundation. She, her actual first week was the uh, week that everyone came to us about the industry center for the health community. Uh, she's, uh, she came to us from uh, the Nature Conservancy. She was the international director of marketing and public relations. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is the largest uh, conservation organization um, in the world. It has offices in 50 states and 35 countries. Uh, so she has extensive uh, experience uh, uh, internationally as well as she is also welcome. She grew up here with the top um, and got her degree in the Oklahoma State University. So the Oklahoma State, we have Nebraska, and I'm sure we have many folks in Kansas so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jeff. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, a pleasure to speak with you. I hope you're having a happy new year. And yeah, as Jeff said, uh, we hope this, is, this, this webinar will kind of illustrate uh, some of the support that the uh, foundation can provide and is interested in providing you as you're, you're doing your work through the Healthy Communities Initiative. Um, and Blythe and I would also strongly encourage you, if you have any questions or comments, to use that chat feature. Uh, we would love for this to be um, as useful as possible for you. So if you have any comments or questions, uh, definitely, uh, definitely uh, raise, your, raise your hand or, or submit a, a comment to the chat feature. So this, uh, my part of the 
presentation is really going to focus on kind of the technical aspects of, uh, of the data brief that uh, foundation staff developed and, and uh, we shared with you earlier this week. Uh, so I have the boring part of the presentation, but I, I think it's an important part of the presentation to see you understand uh, so what was in that data brief and, and how it can, maybe how it shouldn't be used. And the black will have the, the interesting part of the, of the conversation speaking more about how you could use information like the data on the county profiles for your local work. Uh, the data from the uh, profiles comes from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. And uh, people typically refer to it as purpose, which is kind of a gross name uh, or whatever. But rather than saying all that, I will probably refer to purpose. Uh, throughout this call and just know that uh, I'm, I'm not uh, having a, a, an event. I'm uh, just referring to the, the survey. Um, and the purpose is an annual ongoing telephone survey that provides key health risk and chronic disease data for, uh, for all of you at states and territories and districts of Columbia. Um, the, uh, uh, the behavioral risk factor surveillance system includes uh, uh, data on things like diabetes incidents, uh, tobacco use, physical activity, nutrition, health care access, and, and on and on. Uh, there's a, a core set of questions and then some modules that state to me. And typically, uh, the BRFSS is conducted at the local level, or at the state level, and provides state level estimates for uh, not only the state as a whole, but uh, you can compare across uh, gender, you can compare across income categories, race, ethnicity, and, uh, and education levels as well. The foundation, uh, through a grant to the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, supports uh, expanded data collection. So in Kansas, we're actually fortunate that uh, there is more local data through the, through the purpose than um, most other states have. Um, so with uh, the data we're going to present, uh, the health department is actually, elated, actually able to conduct over 20,000 interviews with Kansans, and uh, they're able to provide county-level estimates for roughly half the Kansas counties and for all 15 of the state's public health preparedness regions. And then, again, the county profiles that we uh, shared with you were developed by staff at the foundation, uh, specifically Kate Bill Height, who's also on this call, and Jonathan Rivers. And the intent of the county profile is really to provide to you with local data that's most relevant to the Healthy Communities Initiative. So as you saw, each of the, the profiles includes indicators related to exercise and physical activity, food and vegetable consumption, weight status, and chronic disease incidents. Uh, incidents of chronic diseases that are related to the lack of physical activity and, and, uh, and lack of healthy eating. And uh, if you haven't seen the county profile yet, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, for each HCI community, we pulled this information together. Uh, this happens to be the profile for Sedgwick County. Uh, and I, I didn't mention this on the early on the earlier slide, it was on the screen, but the data for the uh, brief comes from 2011, and that is the most recently available local versus data for Kansas. And the Department of Health uh, just published that data online uh, a few months ago or a couple months ago. So uh, although the data is from 2011, it's really consider it hot off the presses. It, uh, obviously, we have 20,000 surveys, and we need to pull the data together um, and you know, do the things necessary to analyze data to take, uh, to take some time. Um, and this is, uh, this is what it looks like and how we've organized uh, the data. Now, for the next few slides, I just want to walk through where you can go to find additional data, additional DRSSS data, if you would like additional information. Because really, we only pulled out a subset of the exercise and physical activity and fruits and vegetables indicators that uh, are in the VRFSS, and um, you may be interested in others. So there's a website developed uh, by KDHG that allows you to go in and, and really pull whatever data you would like from the VRFSS, from the local data. Um, your 
allows you to select from a wide range of indicators. This one obviously happens to be for the percentage of adults who report consuming uh, fruit less than once per day. Uh, you can find the weighted percent or the percentage of uh, residents of the county or the region who responded uh, to that indicator. So for Allen County, 48.4% of adults report consuming uh, fruit less than one time per day. The, um, uh, the report itself that we shared with you and the system also includes a margin of error. So the margin of error is uh, basically um, you know, the plus or minus range within which uh, the true or the, the actual estimate or the actual rate is likely to lie. So the smaller this margin of error number, the more precise the, the rate is likely to be, the more precise the estimate is likely to be. So we'll pick back up on that thought here in a moment. There's also a map which illustrates uh, kind of the, um, uh, the rate across the state. Importantly, the states that are tan or yellow, or sorry, the counties that are uh, tan or yellow, didn't have a large enough sample, didn't have enough respondents to be able to provide county level data. So for those counties, we'll talk about how we, how we approach that work to ensure that you have the best available data for your and again, there's a wide range of indicators you can you can look at. So you can go to the website and click select the data. This is the list of potential exercise and physical activity and fruits and vegetable consumption indicators. So again, we only pulled a, a few of those uh, from the list. And you may be interested in looking at other indicators. Uh, and we would certainly encourage you uh, to you know, go to the system and, and uh, do some of this uh, work yourself or to contact us if you have uh, other data and you questions about the system. And you can also look at the data by either county level or the public health preparedness region level uh, simply by clicking on the geography uh, button on the website, um, which again is important because there are several counties uh, more than half of the counties actually for which there won't be county level estimates. There simply is just uh, too small of a sample size, even with 20,000 uh, respondents overall. Uh, fortunately, there is data for every one of the 16 public health preparedness regions, as you can see, as you can see here. Uh, this happens to illustrate the percentage of adults with diagnosed diabetes. And you can see based on the concentration of dark blue across the state where, uh, you know, where diabetes incidence uh, tends to be higher. And again, each of those uh, areas on that map in this slide represent uh, public health preparedness regions. So if you, um, if you haven't reviewed the county profile, um, uh, you when you do so, you may find that for some indicators, we, we did not have a county level estimate and we had to pull data for that indicator from these regions. And I uh, have an illustration of that here, here in a second. Uh, this slide illustrates the county profile for Franklin County. Uh, so a couple things I wanted to illustrate here. Um, you see this on the slide for fresh, uh, for fruits and vegetables. Uh, the percentage of adults reported consuming food one or more times a day. The, the estimate, according to the survey, was 48.5 percent. But the, the margin of error, or the plus minus around that estimate, was 8.5 uh, percent. So the margin of error suggests that the actual rate lies between 40 and 57 percent for Franklin County for that indicator. I don't think it's important for you to, to really focus on the margin of error other than to recognize that even though there may be apparent differences with the state level estimate, uh, some folks could say that, well, that's not a statistically significant difference uh, because the margin of error is, uh, or the confidence intervals overlap to those indicators. Uh, for Franklin County, that's not the case. Uh, uh, the state level estimate is 58.6%. And uh, the, the, the range 
range is plus or minus 0.9 around that. So actually at Franklin County, uh, there is a statistically significant difference based on kind of a margin to error approach to, uh, to looking at the data. You also see for Franklin County that there were two indicators for which we didn't have county level data. Um, so we pulled data from the East Central Public Health Preparedness Region, which includes Franklin County, but also uh, Morris Case, Greenwood, Lyons, uh, Coffee, Yates, and Wabanti. Wabanti, my New York uh, hasn't been uh, completely kicked out of my system yet. Um, but that is the best data for those two indicators that we have available for Franklin County. It's not specific to only the county, but it's specific to the region in which Franklin County lies. So that's another thing to, um, uh, to uh, take into account when you're looking at the profile and considering how you may use the data. Uh, some of the indicators will be for the county, and some will be for the region. If you're interested in more information, uh, there are a couple other recommendations for websites that you can go to to find data regarding physical activity, nutrition, weight status, and, and uh, related chronic diseases. So the first is the CDC, the RSSS, the Berkeley website. Um, that will allow you to look at comparisons between Kansas as a whole. It won't have local data, it won't have county level data, but you can look at Kansas as a whole you can compare to Kansas uh, and Kansas' neighboring states, uh, and you can look at uh, more uh, demographic breakdowns for, uh, for the state. Uh, the other option is to uh, look, at the, uh, look at the data for, for the county health rankings, um, and the web link is there, and I'll illustrate that here in a second. Uh, the county health rankings provide county level data for many health related indicators. And I'm sure you know, I'm sure many of you are familiar both with Bertha and the County Health Rankings. Um, uh, so the county health rankings do provide county level data. But for most of the indicators that come from from Bertha, uh, they actually aggregate seven years of data to come up with an annual estimate just because the sample sizes are so low for many counties. Um, so that's clearly something to be cautious about is that the, kind of the, the, the rating, the ranking, the, the, uh, the actual rate and the county health rankings in some cases are based on seven years worth of data that have been pooled together. Uh, but that said, um, you can find data regarding obesity, physical inactivity, access to recreational facilities, uh, and access to healthy, uh, healthy foods, uh, uh, concentration of fast food uh, restaurants in the county. So that certainly is also valuable information. Um, this is an illustration with the link for the CDC, the RFSS page. Um, obviously, if you're able to see the slides here, you can uh, you know, select the state you're interested in, the year you're interested in, and um, kind of the category for the, uh, the data that you're interested in. Um, most of you for this project would be most interested in uh, exercise, fruits and vegetables, uh, and physical activity along with some of the, uh, some of the science of these specific data. And here's the county health rankings page, uh, which allows you to really narrow down to the uh, profile for each county that includes a wide range of, uh, of indicators. So, so there are different options available to you. I guess I would, I would stress in summary that uh, the local data is often or maybe always important to make the case for community level change. And the local Kansas CRFSS data can help you paint the picture for your HPI grant and the uh, policy priorities that you're working toward through this project. Um, unless your community has conducted another assessment or you're aware of, of better data, the local Kansas CRFSS data do provide the best information about how to be doing active living and related health consequences for your community. Uh, just make sure you're keeping into account kind of the, the, the fact that there is a margin of error and that some of the estimates we provided uh, may be for the region rather than the county. Um, and uh, uh, you know, it, 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 while the, the data, the local BRFS data, do provide the best estimates, uh, uh, there are some of those limitations. And if you have any uh, questions or concerns from more of a methodological standpoint and, and how to use the data, you can certainly get in touch with us. And, and we're happy to help answer those questions or to, uh, to pull in someone from your health department who can help answer those questions. Uh, 
now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dwight for the exciting part. Thanks, Dad. Do we, do you want to pause for just a second and ask the questions on that first? Or should we jump right into the statements and then let the state questions to them? There's a lot of information that I want to make sure the questions and those people are going to do that. Well, certainly if people have a question, um, you can raise their hand or send it in. Um, okay. Okay. Yep. So it looks like we have questions in this field. All right. We'll get started. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for um, for having me today. I'm really excited to speak with you and to get to know both of you in, in the coming weeks and months. Um, I don't know about you, but these phone calls feel a little stuffy to me when you have lots and lots of people and you've got some people talking at you. So I thought I would start by sharing a little bit more about me. This is me and my family, my husband Christopher and our son, Wilson and Wyatt, who are eight and six. And this is a local race that we ran here in Wichita. Um, as uh, a definition, I moved back to Wichita after 15 years in Washington, D.C. I spent about eight years at the American Red Cross, where I was uh, split my time between marketing and then I spent some time in philanthropy in the development department. I was actually there during both 9 11 and Hurricane Katrina. Uh, amazing experiences. Um, also, I spent some time consulting, and then I stepped into the higher the nature conservancy uh, and spent some time primarily in, in marketing in that environment. So back to these, back to the spot, excuse me, and um, let's see, some other personal anecdotes. Um, my favorite book in the world is Self Canto by Anne Pichet. So if you are looking for a good read, please look into it. And there are two four-legged um, children that are not pictured in this, and they're my girls, my standard poodles, Odessa and Tessie, who are 11. So if you're a fellow poodle lover, feel free to message me and we can talk about those. So let's get into it. Strategic communications. I know that all of you have experience with strategic communications, and I won't spend too much time on this slide. I do think it's an important part of developing the strategy, asking yourself some of these key questions. When you think about your policy goal, who has the power to make the changes that you need to get done? What influences them? For example, superintendents and teachers are influenced by local and active parents. Obviously, elected officials are influenced by their system. I'm sure many, if not all of you, are focused on fundraising at some point in your year. Um, in a major gift strategy, we talk about the sphere of influence and try to identify the individuals who are connected through alumni networks, serving on nonprofit boards together, serving on the CPA, members of clubs, etc. It's important that you do a focused plan so that you laser in on the individuals you're trying to impact. So if you know enough about them to know how they want to receive information and what might influence them. Then broadly when we talk about policy change, there's a, a mass channel or a consumer component because there is power in numbers and power is need. This is also part, obviously, of your coalition building. We're all thoughtful about who is best to deliver the message, and that's going to be a big part of your strategy. So it's important to remind us of this framework when we talk about how you use the data. I am not a math whiz. Uh, in fact, I will confess to you that many people who major in journalism will tell you that avoiding math classes was a component in their career choice. Um, however, I do love data. Data is incredibly helpful in making your case, and the DRFSS data has many, many uses. Okay, so how to use the data? First, you obviously want to pick apart which pieces help tell the best story. If you're focused on pedestrian bike ways and walkways, you're obviously going to go after the data about physical activity in your community. If you're working for healthy vending and access to healthy food, it's incredibly important to know how adults in your community are faring with their food and vegetable intake. When I see comparisons, I immediately look for the largest discrepancies. And for many of you, your community pretty closely reflects the average Kansas. I've pulled out some quick examples. So in Brown County, the percentage of adults who consume fruit one or more times a day is 51 percent, compared to the state average of 58 percent. So that's not very a uh, very big gap, but it's certainly not it's certainly a, a, an intense um, statistic. The USDA recommends that we make half of our plates as adults filled with fruits and vegetables. And here we see only every other person in the ground is eating even one serving of fruit a day. Even though that spread is small, the totals are 
be LinkedIn enough to start a conversation. In city county, it's not that way. The percentage of adults who are overweight or obese is 76 percent, compared to the average change of 64. So that's certainly enough to get someone's attention as far as dialogue. Each county is different. We know living in your community what people are especially proud of or displeased with. You know the friendly rivals, etc. And Jeff talked earlier how to manipulate the data to build different comparisons. So I just think that we to do that if it's helpful. Here are a few ideas of where your key influencers and other stakeholders are in your community and where I'm confident you are already presenting and participating. In the simplest form, you can incorporate the DRFSS data into your presentations for local table of commerce meetings, rotary clubs, meetings with the health departments, etc. I had an opportunity to speak with Megan Carmichael, the API coordinator for Thomas County, and she's a leader at Smart Start Support to get a sense of how she might use data like this. Now, unfortunately, she had a conflict and couldn't be with us, so I'll just share a bit of our conversation. She was telling me that there is a diplomat ladies' lesson. It's a social gathering for businessmen and it's whole week to network. And she used that as an example of a place where she might go and provide some progress to them about her, her um, organization, what they're doing, and also use the data as the excuse to come forward and say, it's a new year, we have new information, and let's talk about what we're going to do together in 2014. Uh, she also mentioned that e-figures can help with other grant writing when she's seeking out site funding. I thought that was really helpful. On the media side, you see I put the telegram and the eagle. Reporters love data. A new report or new statistics is practically the definition of news. Timeliness, impact, proximity are all the new elements. You can build this into your next plan of scouting with journalists or bloggers. So if you don't have anything planned today, here are some ideas of how you can get started with mainstream social media. But just many people on the call are varying levels of experience and comfort working with the media. But I think we all agree that news plays a role in influencing attitudes and behaviors when it comes to policy change. And I understand as part of the API focus, we have monthly engagement goals. So I'm, I'm hopefully going to help there. This first one, editorial board meetings can be formal at larger papers or quite casual in smaller markets. I recommend you use the new year as your excuse. One study shows that 45% of Americans make New Year's resolutions. In 2012, the number one resolution was to lose weight, and the number five was staying fit and healthy. Healthy eating and active living is already top of mind at this time of year, so embrace it. Newspapers across campus are hungry for content. I'm sure you know this. Editorials don't have to be long. You can read with these statistics. Acknowledge this is top of mind for your community now and promote what you're doing to help people live fuller, healthier lives. Be sure to end with a call to action for readers and viewers and listeners to get involved and help them have something specific to do. If you're in a mar larger market like the Pico, which is in Kansas City, consider providing information to someone in their graphics department. Most larger papers won't take pre-produced graphics, so they'll accept data and turn it into something for themselves. So I have um, some language here that, that we can sort of rough out. Um, this could be a, an example of an editorial. It's that time every year when we all prepare for a fresh start, a new year, new opportunities to improve ourselves. A new statewide survey reveals 57% of us in Johnson County is overweight or obese. The problem is severe and the solutions are complex. So this is where you would start going into um, the focus area, um, some of the text for example, to see if you're working with business leaders, if you're helping residents with access to healthy food, working with local leaders to plan and decide public spaces. That's where you, you incorporate the meat of what you're doing. And then certainly the call to action, I think, is, is, is critical. Make sure you give people something specific to do. And the goal, of course, is to inspire them enough to take an action and, and get started. Um, for those of you not used to working with media, this could be a potential trick uh, on how to just pick up the phone and go for it. So this is how I pitch because other people have different ideas. You know, usually the first thing I say is, hi, this is Blair from the Campus Health Foundation. Do you have a minute or did I touch you on deadline to make sure that you're not trying to pitch someone who's not going to listen? And then talk about the fact we have new statistics 
and this is a just a really newsworthy, even though there's 2011, we haven't been out yet. So it's an opportunity for you to be the first to introduce you to this if you're a reporter. I recommend, you know, uh, mentioning a statistic, and then you know, it's up to you. You could say, I'd like to, you know, schedule a 15 minute call or a short meeting, or you might be prepared to just take them right then and start talking to them. And make sure, obviously, as you're thinking about working with reporters, that you're thinking about the right folks people, and that you're thinking about characters for your story, so that you're not just giving your perspective, but you're also helping to think about other community residents who would be backing up and supporting and, and uh, helpful with, with your pictures as well. Ah, social media. So here are a few examples. I am I am not creativity is not my strength. So I apologize in advance for this, but I try to pull out some statistics on things like Reno County, um, in Newton, health rankings, and then you know, something fun, right? So keep it light when you can. We could be this true about Allen County. 77% of people are right-handed or active in the past 30 days or have visited the state capital. You know, take your guess and we'll answer tomorrow. You know, just do what you can to have fun with it and use your media, your social media um, followers to, to jump into conversation with you. All right, now, I mentioned earlier that I was going to talk at you for a little bit and then I wanted to look at some feedback, so now is the time. Um, I'd love to put us on the spot and see if I can get three people to volunteer to share with me one way they anticipate using this data to help further their ACI policy objectives. I'm happy to provide ideas, but I know that the best network is you, your peer group. So um, this is a little different. You can't just shout out, but I know you can certainly raise your hand and chat. So I'd love to uh, leave some awkward silence for a few moments to see who might jump in for us. And we have a comment here. Um, but before we go on, we'll just take a moment and see if there's anyone that comes forward. Just the Okay. And I want you to give me a second of the that the same way for me to give you a second of the future. There you are. And Molly, you should be unmuted uh, at this point. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, this is the first time I'm doing it this way with the computer, so I didn't want to be hearing. Um, we're currently working with Hutchinson Community College to uh, welcome the goal of these those faculty free, but uh, we're using um, some of the faculty to the county to help justify um, you know, some of the things that we're doing with that community college. Excellent, thanks. So let me say to that you're working with Hutch Community College on some uh, um, working for tobacco free and that you're interested in sharing some of that data with us. Do you have a meeting coming up soon, or how do you anticipate sharing it? Any initial thoughts? Well, initially it was set up with the, um, you know, the leadership, so I so we had some of the resources and the athletic department. But now we've got uh, the Student Government Association, and it seems I found that um, committee and the organization very interested in this. So we actually have a meeting with them January 21st to help them uh, Began setting up their own student-run smoking campaign for campus. So we're hoping to transfer some of the things we've been doing on campus so that they now have empowerment to do it themselves and can, can sustain the project. Um, you know, after we pulled out or after we're kind of exiting um, and being so visible on campus. So the best that's on the twenty first is the student government. That's fantastic, and I'm sure you've already gotten onto this, but make sure you. Um, uh, my recommendation would be that you also get the student paper and world board engaged. I think that that's a great opportunity to, to get some of the students involved as well and have that connection across the students and the, and the faculty. And uh, that's a really good idea, and we'll talk about that too. And then one of the things we're going to do is show them um, as the students that are going to be running these campaigns how to access the data and where they can find it so that they can you know, continue to kind of alter or 
create their own um, awareness campaign um, and sustain our programs themselves. So those that lady pointed out um, to show them where we find it so that they can get access it themselves.
And at some point, if there are any things that you want to share, and why I appreciate so much for trying to engage our grantees, um, let's give you a whole life here to think about this. If there's some things you want to share, whether they're challenging or positive things moving along with your policy work, um, you can send me an email or talk to one of your TA providers. We have your monthly call. And let's consider um, thinking in advance of some things we might share on this 1 o'clock that would help each other. There are five teams. I just want to remind you of the January 21st Nutrition Standards Workshop. Celine, Riley, Johnson, Douglas, and Seward. Check your inbox to make sure that you have final information for me. I still have a few questions for a few of you so we can wrap up getting ready for that workshop. So check your inbox, please. Two more reminders. The semi-monthly tracking form is due January 15th. And as usual, if you have any questions, check with one of your TA providers. It's just a reminder for that deadline, which is coming right around the corner. Also, near to that deadline, um, for the HCI-1, so that's the original 12 communities, um, Thomas, Dickinson, Finney, Seward, Johnson, Barton, Riley, Mitchell, Shawnee, Douglas, Seward, and Brown, the original 12. Um, Innovation Network would really, really like to have, by January 17th, your interview list and your contact mapping form. You did this at the convening in October 2012, so it's not new to you. But if you have questions about that, again, contact your TA providers. Um, please do try to meet these deadlines as best you can. We can turn the information back around you, to you for you to use. I think that's all the announcements I have. Again, um, sorry about glitches with the WebEx system today. It's going to be a great system for us, though. And we will get that so everyone can get online by next month. Thank you so much, Vicki. Um, and uh, if we don't have any other questions or comments at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jeff. Yes. Um, it looks like we have a couple comments, but it, it comes in a privately, so I'm not sure if you share it or not. But Bob Hedberg did mention Kansas Health Matters, and, uh, and Jeff responded to Bob. Uh, thanks, Bob. Many of you may have heard the webinar um, that was, I think it was our time. Is that right, Vicki? Um, around health, health matters? Yes, it is. Yeah, so we have an archive uh, presentation on cancer health matters. That, that is another excellent uh, uh, place to get data. Uh, and then two others are actually also uh, setting the uh, unknown screen and check on Pat on top, which is an initiative that cancer actually facilities this month today. So I would encourage everyone to uh, check that out. Um, so, um, any other questions or comments that you might have? I do have a few uh, kind of uh, 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 announcements on our end regarding uh, the 50% match and uh, the grant staff report that we want uh, and the proposals for the ACI. If you have any other questions, uh, uh, go ahead and throw those to step up. Or raise your hand. I'm not seeing any. Um, the, the first, the first um, thing I might, I think I've talked to some people and we've shared, we haven't officially sent a letter out, but preparing a letter, um, we're preparing a letter right now to go out to the HCI uh, 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 one meeting around the 50% match. We are liberalizing the requirements for the match. We're going to allow, um, the community to use personnel. Um, if you've already uh, received the cash match, uh, I would still encourage you to go ahead and use that cash match. Uh, but we will also allow um, uh, matching in terms of having staff to a portion of that match. So let me just read to you uh, what, how, we, how we will define that. The Kansas Health Foundation recognizes that there are organizations and local communities that have responsibilities promoting healthy eating and active living. If those organizations will commit personnel in the form of a portion of their salary equal to or greater than to the 50% of, of, of the following year's grant and allow the staff identify with these preferred duties directed by the healthy community in this leadership team, the Kansas Health Foundation will count that towards the required 50% grant. 
Um, and, and basically, all we will need is a letter from the organized organization committing to the personal mass as defined above, and will be required to be submitted prior to receiving the following year's implementation response. So, so that's kind of liberalizing. We're hoping that that will also help uh, really engage some of those organizations who already do this work uh, in the into the work of the public community initiative. I really think that my experience has been that when people begin working they do this work as their work, it really helps sustain that coalition or the reach of the uh, into the future. Um, so that's, that's the one announcement. So the other one is, um, as, as I announced at the next October convening, we were going to, since many of the healthy communities, two uh, communities have already identified their policy priorities, we, we started everyone on the reporting process uh, on, on uh, involving the community change framework. And I appreciate everyone submitting those reports. Thanks. Um, uh, and then we'll, the other thing we're we didn't want to, with HCI 1, we had a six month law where we, we, we submitted their proposal, we reviewed the proposals, and then we, we offered the draft. We decided to use, because everyone's already actively engaged in the work, um, that we, 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 we want to speed that process up. So the HCI 2 community um, will submit the grant status report basically in the form of smart objectives on how they're going to implement the community change framework in the next year. So we're hoping to um, uh, really not only make it, we, we know enough about the process that you're going through. Our TA team reports back regularly. We get those semi-monthly report forms. We know the activity that's going on. And we don't want you to have to read uh, just work, uh, uh, you know, write together a narrative or proposal about that work. So, so the extension grant status report will be your plan for the next year. Uh, and we'll be sending out specific directions very soon uh, on how to do that. Um, and uh, the other thing that, that uh, we want to, to talk about with the HCI 1 community, um, we're going we're gonna to ask for the same thing. So, their grant status report, the first grant status report at the end of the year, will be um, a plan for meeting the community change framework using smart objectives. So it really will be helping, and we talked to, I think many of you have seen on the contact form, that the PA providers have been talking to you about setting benchmarks around the semi monthly reporting form that can uh, basically objectives on how you might implement your, your community change framework. This will just formalize that process. So we set some uh, yearly goals, and we'll do that just on a yearly basis, and that will be your plan. That will be in place of the grant status report. So that's my announcement. I, I think uh, we will be getting those letters out and that communication out very soon. I know we're, we're, we're working on it now, so hopefully uh, early next week uh, we should be receiving more detailed information on that. And if you can if you have questions right now regarding that or questions regarding anything else uh, uh, around healthy communities, feel free to either raise your hand or uh, uh, write in the chat box. Well, um, if there are no other comments or questions, I would want to we want to thank you so much for joining us on today's webinar and uh, wish you a great